very pleased tonight to have with us yes. members of the North Reading Minutemen and bringing us a presentation on the Minutemen will be with the able assistance of Roy Walters will be Gordon Hall. Can we welcome Gordon Hall? in terms of giving you a visual presentation, so it's going to be more of an audio presentation. Uh, the folks at home uh, on cable watching this later will get an overlay of many of the things that were planned for tonight. So sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Okay, for those that don't know me, I'm Roy Walters, and I'm the secretary for the Minutemen. I captain Bill McDonough couldn't make it tonight, and he's asked me to do this presentation. I'm happy. I'm happy. Okay. <laughs> Rich Redden is our acting captain tonight, so. So the name of the presentation is called the North Reading Company of Minute Militia with the official title. 22 years and still going strong. And you'll hear that Gordon and I are going to talk about how we formed, which we never seem to discuss, what we did in the middle, and the, then we talked about the buildings we've done, with more information about the buildings than we've ever had before, because every time we go and talk about the building, it shows a pretty building. So now we've got a couple of pictures showing how we put them together, how we disassemble them to get to that point. So, in 1974, the Bicentennial Committee, with Barbara O'Brien, Pat Romy, and Gordon Berridge, organized ideas about forming a Minuteman company. About 35 or 40 potential members gathered to you know, uh, review those ideas, and we did form a company. That company, for some reason, became very cohesive over the years. We didn't all just come and then disappear. So we started in actually complete ignorance of motor dress, manual arms, and marching. And we elected our first captain in that meeting, and recording secretary started taking notes, and that was me. And as a benefit, most of us were veterans and well aware of marching procedures, and, and uh, not to be a wise guy, we, had, we knew a left from a right foot. <laughs> so some of the people in the meeting, that first meeting, you'll remember the names, people you from town. Bob Parker, Frank Romeo, Nick O'Brien, Mike O'Hearn, George Reitmeyer, Alan Holmes, and there was a couple of others I don't recall. But uh, Floyd Eastman. Floyd Eastman, yeah. And uh, I apologize for not knowing them all because the minutes that I took that night are buried somewhere. <laughs> so anyway, during our first six months, Barbara and Pat distributed clothing patterns for our attire. And the comment was always wear, who's going to wear these funny pants? And now we've got two guys doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Minutemen wise sewed the clothing correctly, used the patterns and materials only in basic colors and no stick of things and all that, so whatever they call it. The men are dressed in colonial style and their, their way of dressing is known as attire. Don't tell us your costume looks good. <laughs> attire. <laughs> While we were forming, we went to Reading and met with those people who were forming a company. I met a Doc McCauley, and he had the historical background and knowledge in the importance of doing it right, meaning how to dress, how to behave, how to carry a musket, not so much carrying a musket, but the mode of dress and the way you should act as a patient. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we purchased Japanese copies of brown vest muskets, Made her own leather cartridge pouches, pulled it up, John. John. What? Pulled up your cartridge. I made it, so. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. See? <laughs> Ta da! And purchased probably kind of hats. 
at. Okay. We learned that Von Steuben, Daniel Lodge from the Revolutionary Era, to document the training bills. And that was led by George Reimeyer, who had the experiences teaching us to march and learn that Daniel Lodge and the way you handle a musket is not the way you handle a rifle. So after six months, roughly, we were ready for the red boats. <laughs> so, really. So, the next slide talks about three years of praise, mock battles, and appearances. And I'm not going to, we went to Lexington and Concord praises, it was a big deal in those days. We went to Manchester several times, we were invited out there, if the Darlington and all that. We went to mock battles in Needham, in which we fought British. And we also had an event in North Reading where some police side and rode his horse up and told us the British are coming. <laughs> we did an appearance in Brookline for Queen Elizabeth's birthday from some Queen's outfit. We went to trade shows such as Kirby Vacuum where they donated a sword to us. Can I take that one? And after the trade show, we wanted to go to a restaurant over half a mile away, whatever it was. So we formed up Wimsy's. Wimsy's restaurant. We formed up a tire, muskets, and the wise following, and marched straight across Boston. And Gordon Berridge was the police chief at the time, was panicking because we had no license. <laughs> we go along and I'm telling everybody, you don't see any British, do you? So, <laughs> so we went along in that way. And then we also did an appearance in Sounding Rock, a technical meeting in which I was the leader of that. And we did, did demonstrate how to fire a musket without powder in the room, of course. And the other thing, <clears throat> before we talk later about events, one's going to tell us about Bob Parker, the Battle of Needham. Right. Okay. The church services and a couple of other interesting things you're going to find. So, thank you, Roy. First off, Roy and I have known each other for nearly 50 years. <laughs> we were scouts together and so forth, and then with the Minutemen, we've had a, a really a, a, a nice relationship. It's been wonderful. Um, yes, as he said, we did form up in in uh, in '74, so we'd be ready. Uh, April 19th of 75 and uh, so we did these different things and one of the uh, the reenactment out in uh, Needham was uh, quite interesting uh, we were, of course we were taking on the 10th regiment of foot and they had these beautiful red you know uh, uniforms on and so forth and there we are with a kind of a, you know a, a nothing matches and so forth but anyhow it was quite good we, we'd see them they're very thick wooded area and we would see a red coat and we'd fire at him and vice versa. So Mr. Robert Parker was getting along in years. And another person and I were quite worried about it because it was, it was thick underbrush and, and you had to be careful you didn't go down, you know, fall down some cliffs that weren't cliffs. But anyhow, so we're spending a lot of time trying to find, make sure he's all right, we couldn't find him. <laughs> and the end of the, when we got all through, we all came home. And they, we turned the 9 o'clock news on, and there's Mr. Robert Park firing at a red coat, just, as, just like you'd see in the history books. So, <laughs> there we were all worried about him, and he was fine. <laughs> Another event that took place would have been in, uh, in, in February, I think, of 75. Uh, the, uh, there was a, a reenactment of the original town meeting of, of uh, 1775. So the, the selectman asked us to go up on stage at the, before the town meeting started. And we, uh, we, we got up on stage, and I have my notes here, I've got them in, in, not in order, I'm going to try to name the people. But anyhow, <clears throat> this was not rehearsed, but it, was, it went off so well. Morris O'Hearn was the moderator. He took the name of the original moderator back 200 years before, and we took the names of different uh, other members, people who were there, the Damons and the Pratts and the Parkers and what have you. And I remember at the time, I just thought it was something that we really had a great, 
quite a talented group because the thing went off very well. And I, I thought it was a sort of a, a good beginning for us. Then on, on April 18th, before we were going to Concord, there was a church service at the Congregational Church. And Reverend Foley was dressed in his attire, and so were we, we the Minutemen, of course, and so were several other people. And uh, we, there was a person who was the tiesman who had a long pole with a feather on it. And he was walking up, Roy was walking up and down the aisles of the church to make sure no one fell asleep during the service. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he did find one minute man that was dozing. <laughs> and so he put, you know, the feather on the person's nose and he woke up. <laughs> so the next morning, we mustered at the uh, bachelor school grounds, just as the men men did 200 years previous. And I'd like to tell you that we marched to Concord, but that wouldn't be true. <laughs> we took a bus. <coughs> so when we got to Concord, one of the things we were to do was to march over the bridge. And when we got to the to put, we got ready to march over the bridge, we realized that there were horsemen. There were police officers mounted on their horses, and they were facing down river. And so, as you know, you know how, you know how narrow the bridge is? Well, with them facing that way, there was hardly any room for us. We couldn't march, so we had to go single file behind the horses, because the, uh, what they, the uh, officers were doing was uh, holding uh, some, uh, there were some demonstrators. Uh, and, and they kept them in a little group down there. They kept an eye on them. And so we, we uh, as I said, we didn't march across the bridge, but we went by a uh, uh, single file. And then we went on the rest of the day in Concord, Lexington. I think we marched uh, 13 miles that day. And uh, it was really a great experience. How many of you, of, of you were there? Pardon? How many of you were in the There were 40 of us. Uh -huh. Wow. You know, I have 13. Well, I've actually gained three people in the last couple of years, which is close to one of the tens of a long time. <clears throat> so after many prayers and appearances, we had to change the goals. And they're going to love this. <laughs> the men and men, and men wives said, you better be home more Saturdays and Sundays to get work done around the house. So then all of a sudden, so, we reduced our appearances, and then we organized a war memorial on the Quamet. I don't know if many people know about that. Uh, there's, there's a one World War I stone with 78 names, I think, Lord told me, and we now have 1,300 names of men and ladies that entered the service from North Reading in those periods. For North Reading, I mean, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iran, Afghanistan, and a couple of other local events. And all those names are researched and compiled by Gary Priest of our group. We raised approximately 80% of the $30,000 by private donations and appealed to the town for another $5,000 to complete the work. So basically, people don't know that we are the group that did it was mainly Minutemen. It was one of our activities, and uh, something we're pretty proud, like I always say. So right after that started the West Village Schoolhouse Project, Pat. And that is good down there, isn't it? That is bad. And uh, Lord's ready to talk about the West Village Schoolhouse, some of the activities, and uh, building up. Yes, it was, uh, as Roy said, we, we, things kind of wound down naturally after the bicentennial was over. A lot of the uh, other communities uh, sort of uh, disbanded their Minutemen group, but we kept going. And in, uh, in 1980, Jim Stewart was our captain. He came to one of the meetings and he said that he had, uh, that Pat Romeo and her, the, uh, the historic, North Reading Historic Committee had asked if we would dismantle what we call the Pudding Point School. Uh, and at that time, it, it, which worked out quite well. So we had a meeting and we talked about it and we decided that we knew it was going to be quite a project, but we took it on. 
And uh, that's, so we, we started dismantling uh, the, the building, as you know, uh, probably know. The building was on the corner of uh, uh, Park Street and Route 28. And it was right next to Meltzer's Furniture. And at that time, it was McMillan's Garage. So we, we started, we got a small crane there, we started taking it apart. We put up signs saying the, that we're dismantling the Pudding Point School, which was, it was kind of, had a nice ring to it. Well, it really wasn't true, it was really a West Village school, but we didn't know that until we got well into it. And besides, it, 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 I think we got a lot of uh, mileage out of the name Pudding Point, because people would come by, they'd blow them on, sometimes they'd bring us lunch, because we were working in bad weather, there was, there was snow and rain and what have you. And we had a timetable, I don't know how many uh, days we had to get it dismantled before, as Pat said, the bulldozers are on their way. So we took it down, and, uh, and, and, and in the meantime, while we're doing this, Jim Stewart is making arrangements for the Historic Society and the town as to where we're going to put it. So then they made the arrangements that we found that it was going to be located down in the lower field behind the Putnam House. So what, what we did, the way we dismantled it was uh, uh, not piece by piece in a sense. We, uh, on, the, on the long sides, of we, we cut it with a chainsaw. So we wanted the two fairly, uh, four fairly large pieces because we did it to both sides. And we had the front of it and then the back of it. And we put it on a flatbed truck. And uh, at 5 o'clock one morning with Chris Escort, we brought it down here. <laughs> and so we, we put it, uh, we brought it down and we leaned it against the tree, all these pieces against the tree. And we started to raise money. Well, what we always did, whenever we had a project, and this was all of the other projects we've done, we started raising money through our own, uh, our own group. That would be the beginning. So anyway, we're trying to raise money so we can put in a foundation and what have you. Well, we got the foundation in the early part of 81. And then I don't know what happened, but we kind of lost interest or took our eye off the wall. I'm not sure which. But we heard through the grapevine that people in town were saying, those Minutemen will never put that schoolhouse on. <laughs> Taking it down was just the tip of the iceberg. They'll never put that back on. So that very weekend after we heard that, we got a hold of the person with a front end loader. And before that weekend was over, we had three sides up. Now they were, of course, not permanent, but they were braced and ready, ready for you know the permanent time up, tying them together permanently. And then we put the roof rafters on, and then the roof and, and all that. And then at the same time, we realized that looking at pictures of that building, there was a bell tower. And so while putting it back together, we could see where the timbers had been notched out for the original bell tower. So we decided that we would, we would build a bell tower, put it on there, and so that it would look identical. And, and that's what we did. And we use it for our meetings now, and um, the, the uh, Historic Society used it for their Apple Festival, and they put a uh, Christmas tree in, the, uh, in there, in the, during Christmas time, and also uh, the third or fourth graders come down in the spring, and I'm not sure about the fall, and have a class there. Uh, Nancy Ferretti uh, now runs those classes. So it was, it was really quite successful, and uh, we're kind of pleased about that. The next project that we that we took on, after this was done, which and, and many of you probably remember in 1995, uh, the, Don, the Downing House on Gowing Lane burned. It was an old farmhouse. And <clears throat> it, it, uh, well, if we had, uh, go ahead, pictures of it here. We don't need that show them now. Anyhow, the, I don't know just exactly how this all came out, but I know that the, the, the Historic Society folks knew that this Sergeant George Flint House was, there was a such a place, there's such a building here in North Reading. And it was the first building ever built in North, in what is now North Reading. And, and they they knew about where it was, and I think they even went looking at the cellar hole of the foundation of where it originally was. 
but I'm not sure, I know they found that, but I'm not sure when they learned that that very building was an L onto the old farmhouse that burned. So, as I said, I'm not sure when they discovered that. However, they contacted us and asked us if we would go and take down the Sergeant George Flint house and mark all the timbers and so that we could put it back up. Now, some of them were charred and some were not usable, but some of them we could use for patterns and so forth. So we, uh, we took it down, marked things and so forth, and we, we stored the parts in the barn, the front house barn. And uh, then we, the, then what we did is we got a whole, we, we, uh, we needed someone to guide us through this because we're not all builders, we got different, come from different backgrounds. So we got all the mark call and asked him to kind of guide us through it. And then we got a hold of Bob Schneider and asked him to do the excavating. And then we we found a, a, a foundation person. And then we also found a post and beam company in New Hampshire. And there again, we're starting to raise money again, starting with ourselves first. And then, uh, and then uh, we were, well, I don't know, we were having, I don't think we're having the uh, country western dances for this. I think we had to, to raise money for the school house. But anyway, we was, was trying to raise money and at the same time trying to uh, you know, get a foundation in and so forth. And there again, I don't know, uh, we kind of maybe dragged our feet, but we got the word from the Historic Society, you know, you guys got to get those beams out of the barn. So anyway, we, we went ahead and we talked to the Post and Beam for it's a little small company up in New Hampshire, told them that we would like to incorporate three of the original beams. Because this this was a this was a block house and it was built in 1668. And so there were three beams of that original beams that we wanted to save. And so they were able to incorporate those beams into the into the building, which they are there now, and, uh, and they're in good shape. So we put it together, and uh, we also learned from the history books, uh, or a history book from Reading, that the, because it was a block house, that the, uh, they used inch and a quarter oak for the outside of it to protect, because the reason why it was a block house, because there were, there were uh, Indian attacks up in Havel at the time when the Flints moved up from Salem. So we did the same thing we put it's not inch and a quarter oak, it's, I think it's one inch oak, but on the outside. And then we put we put shutters over the windows so that if there was an Indian attack, you could close the shutters. And we had a, a, a nice uh, fireplace uh, and chimney built of bricks that came from a house in Linfield that was built in 1700, and those, those bricks were given to us. So uh, then, you know, we have, an, uh, in, in the second floor, there's a rope bed, which came from Molly Raya's store. And we, you know, we think that she probably used that, but it's up there. Um, and we have, uh, we have uh, other furniture downstairs. But another nice thing I think happened recently, you know, in the last couple of years, is one of our members died, <clears throat> and his name was Jerry Levine, and his wife bought all this, his, colonial attire and gave it to us. I had no idea what we were going to do with it until uh, my wife suggested, why don't we hang it throughout the building, inside, and it looks perfect. If you go up the stairs, you'll see some stockings hanging, you know, colonial stockings hanging near the, the uh, chimney, you know, to, to dry and what have you, and this lady's uh, attire and men's attire, I think it looked quite nice in there. So, Think now that the next thing that we the next thing that we talked about that came up at a meeting uh, well I would say about five years ago that what if we uh, what if we built farm museum when North Reading was an agricultural town and a lot of us remember uh, the uh, market gardeners that were here when we were young uh, I know of you know three or four of them and so forth so. We talked about it. We talked to the Historic Society about it. 
and we, so we decided what we would do is take some farm machinery we knew was around already and put it on display where at the footprint of where we would build the building just to see if it would uh, if people were interested in it and uh, that would have been well we did that for an apple festival about four or five years ago and we found that there was uh, really a great deal of interest so then we went ahead and did the same thing we we go we got a little Mark Paul, we got a little Clark Snyder, went to the uh, West the Historic Society first. They gave us their blessing. And then we went to the Historical District Committee, which we needed to get their approval. And then we did the same thing, same foundation people, uh, same host and being people, and put up this building. It's 60 feet long and 22 feet deep. And it was suggested uh, at, at the historical committee meeting that we copy what was the uh, carriage shed behind the Congregational Church, which was taken down in 1958. And so it, that's exactly what it looks like. The uh, only thing is we put doors on it because we needed to. But other than that, it's basically the same shape, same length and what have you. And we have uh, a, a lot of nice equipment in there. Uh, we have some one kind of thing that kind of struck me funny is when we had that display before we built the building, uh, Roy just put all the signs down there and so forth. And he's down there talking to people and they ask questions and so forth. And uh, a lady came up to him or someone did and said to him, uh, asked him a question about the corn machine the number nine mowing machine, which we've got a, nine, a six foot um, swap. And uh, she, they asked him this question, he says, look, I only knew what a, I didn't know what a, a mowing machine was until last week. I'm a rocket engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he went. But, but, but I can still swing it, though. <laughs> <laughs> so then we, we have Mr. Raymond Turner's tractor, his 1931 Fordson tractor. Uh, which some of you may remember seeing this time of year, if you drove down Elm Street, you'd see Mr. Turner out there cutting his, he had a, there's an attachment on to cut cardboard. You'd see Mr. Turner, even in his 80s, uh, out there cutting his cardboard for the winter. And so when we have that, and we have, uh, we have numerous uh, other things there, and something that just happened to us just recently is that we got a, con I got a call from the Eisenhower family, of which a lot of you know, that was a big family in town, they had big farms. I think there were five brothers, and uh, they had greenhouses up here, and you know, about the Eisenhower pond, what have you. Well, anyhow, they have a tractor that they want us to have, and it's very unusual. I mean, it basically is going to show uh, New England ingenuity at its best. The different things that that they added as they needed to. Uh, you don't believe half the things that they have a model A forward uh, rear end upside down with cables on it to raise a front end motor that they built and, and the whole thing. So we, as of this week, that will be moved into the museum. And it's gonna be, I think anyhow, uh, they're very pleased about the whole family uh, has wanted this to happen for ages. So I think it's a nice thing. And then, uh, am, I, am I taking too much time? No. Is there room for that? I, it sounds like a big piece. Uh -oh. that, that, That's the real question. That, that, is, the, that, that is the question. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 That's, but we're going to get it anyway. Okay. We're gonna, well, I want to have it for the Apple Festival. We'll see it Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's fine. You know. <laughs> you <don't> know. <laughs> and then the final, the, the, the last building that we did uh, <clears throat> was the um, first meeting house. And uh, it was, as everyone knows, it was at 135 Chestnut Street where Mr. Sidney Eaton lived. And uh, Mr. Eaton, Sidney died, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago. He was 99. He was that person that rode the bicycle around town, had the wooden box on the back. Is there a picture? Was there a picture of him up there? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. You should pass him out. Some people may not remember him. But anyhow, we were hoping 
that we everybody knew, or the historic people in town knew, that that first meeting house was was on the premises there. And uh, so we we're hoping that he would give it to us. Uh, uh, we even approached him, asked if he'd give it to the Minutemen, and he said no. <laughs> He's going to give it to the uh, the uh, Massachusetts Historic Society. And uh, so. Uh, <clears throat> much to our surprise, about three or four years later, that Romeo called and said, listen, uh, he wasn't the new owner, but it was, when I, after Sydney died, there was a new owner. And he said, she said that he wanted to give that to the Historic Society. So she asked us if we would, uh, would dismantle it and take down, I wish, I wish we could see the pictures of it. We've got some nice pictures of it. Of this dismantling and so forth. But so we did. We, we did the same thing. We got touch with the same people. And, and we dismantled it. And uh, we uh, we found some, we found three, uh, three nine sash windows. And, and, and we had. Uh, we had five, six sash windows was given to us. We wanted to put in a, a, a nine over six windows to make it a kind of what that did with. And uh, so we had, you know, we needed to make, we needed to get some other, those other sashes made to match. We went to a little shop on uh, Havel and they, they made these for us. And we went to uh, a place called the Window, Window Woman in Amesbury. And they assembled the whole the, uh, the whole window encasement for us. And then uh, at one of our, uh, well, at an Apple Festival, before we did this, a uh, person came through and said, listen, uh, I cut glass. I know about glass. And he said, oh, well, you guys get ready to put uh, the windows in, just let me know. Uh, well, here he is here now tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we, my, my son gave us some early glass, very old glass, and he, he would go uh, cut it off to the size for us and showed us how to putty it in. Now, the putting job doesn't look perfect, but he said it's not supposed to. <laughs> so we, we put those all together and, and installed them and so forth. And, uh, and then uh, we, another thing that we did, we had some leftover, uh, thanks to Pat again, we had some leftover pieces from the second meeting house. As you know, this is the third one. The second one was here, and it got moved down to Elm Street. And when it was uh, when it was taken apart somewhere in the, I would mention the 70s, we got uh, some of the wood from it. So we had one of the one of the local uh, shops here uh, make us some benches out of that wood, so that. You know, just exactly, sort of like they would have looked back in, you know, in that, in 1717 for that church. So, so we have a little bit of the first meeting house and some of the second meeting house in there. And we have a, also a, a podium and so forth. So. Um, well, I don't know how well I did, but I think I was wrong. My son was one of the drummers in 1974. Oh, I used to make right. costumes for him. <laughs> <laughs> he was a drummer from the junior high. You know, the other thing we found about the meeting house, what I call a unique history. Reverend Daniel Putnam preached in that building in the 1720s, we think it was, when the building was on the North Reading Common. Reverend Putnam was the first minister of the Congregational Church in North Reading. In about not about, but in June this year, we celebrated the 300th year anniversary of the new site. So that we have a, the building, not only is a building that housed town meetings and all that, but it does have a unique uh, religious uh, bias, if you will, not a bias, but. And the other thing was, my conclusion was, <coughs> We're still versatile and energetic company. <laughs> Many of the things the last several years have been called saving parts of North Reading history. 
I'm going to, I'm going to rattle off some of the same things. Farm Museum. Opportunity for citizens to visit and recognize North Reading's past agriculture history. People come and visit it. They want to come and they will call us and can we come in to see things. Children men from elementary school come in there, believe it or not, are interested in what they see. Because I've seen Gordon talking at 30 in the middle of time and the hands are going up, what is this for? What's that for? So it's not all tablets and all that stuff. <laughs> West Village Schoolhouse, uh, Flint House, the first meeting house. Authentic reconstruction of these buildings. They're not thrown together. When we had our little article in the Reading Magazine, the uh, author of the article who reviewed other historical buildings complimented us on quality of the work and the, uh, the fact that it was done correctly. And, uh, one thing that I think is really important, in the Farm Museum is a wheat chaffer separator. I don't know what it does. Anyway. Separates the chaff from the wheat. Yeah, from the wheat. Yeah. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Anyway, after the back to the school, they're growing wheat over here, which they'll harvest. When they harvest it, I think the name is Mr. Cassell, is going to take it down to the turnip, uh, turnip down the Farm Museum and operated for these manual operated wheat shaft separated things. So, and then when you combine that activity with the elementary school and the uh, thing at the schoolhouse where somebody teaches in an 1840 class, what we've done in the Minutemen, and this I'm not bragging, we've put together a small village of buildings that is a resource for this town that nobody else has done. We've done it with our own money 90% of this time, and that's why I stand here being bragging. Every one of the Minutemen has the same feeling. We did this. And the last question is, why do the Minutemen do it? And nobody seems to know the answer, except that 20 or 30 guys got together and says, we'll help the historical society, we'll help that Romeo out. Barbara O'Brien, and that's the way it turned out. And we're still active. If you have any buildings to be restored, $30,000, <laughs> we'll do it for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have two of them up here to admire, and they'll show you their clothing if you'd like to see. <laughs> Are there more questions from the floor? Yeah, I do. You can restore this building for thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> down payment. Uh, our rates have gone up since we. This is why we have our friends group. We can baby pay for that. <laughs> we can pay for that. We we uh, we fail to mention that so several of the companies and and organizations oh, yeah. in town have been so helpful to us. With it. it's just been wonderful. And another ironic part of this whole thing seems to be that each building seems to come out about thirty. Where's Jeff? About thirty-four thousand dollars, doesn't it, Jeff? Thirty-five thousand dollars. It right seems check, that Jeff. way. Yeah. Right the check. You're right. And yeah, we never turn a profit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, if I may, I I've been with the group since Jeff should oh. almost the inception, 1975. But I just wanted to make one comment. We're into history. We love history. But you know, when we're doing some of these things, we learn some things about history. I did that I never knew before. And one of the things that always fascinated me is that when we took apart that building, the Pudding Point School, yes. and you get it down to the uh, the support beams, the yes. wooden beams that are on the, on the ground. Yes. It, was, it, was, it was constructed in about 18... 45, I believe. Yes. Two things. There was a big wire netting that was underneath these beams. And I'm saying, what is this all about? And I think we did some, Mr. Parker or perhaps yourself did some research, and it was constructed by some people who came from Minnesota to put this building up. But well, where they came from, they were living in fear constantly of tornadoes, and they just assumed that that would be the case here. And they put wire netting under this whole thing, 
But on each of the four corners, yeah, four Mr. corners yeah, or two Mr. corners anyway, yeah. there was an 1845 coin carefully placed yeah. by those people yeah. as they were constructing the building. Yeah. I found that to be yeah. absolutely yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Why, would the wire, why would the wire mesh work in a tornado? It was to support the frame because they were fearful of tornadoes. It was to anchor the building in the event of a tornado yeah, to keep it all with the structure sound to keep from blowing away. I'm not, I'm not sure if it was done when it was built, but I think Mr. McMillan did it. I think he might be the one that came from the Midwest. That could be, yeah. yeah I think that's, that's how it was. But, uh, yeah. that, that was always fascinating to yeah. me. That's all. Thank you. <laughs>
um, the muskets basically were copies of brown vests that the British Army used. Uh, there were a number of different muskets that the colonial uh, Minutemen used in those days, but the ones we use are basically modeled after the uh, British musket. It's called the brown vest, 50 caliber. It, it actually fires, uh, you know, black powder. We don't fire any. We don't fire the musket balls. But John has an example of a musket ball here. And they were, they were pretty big, uh, you know, when you fired at a British soldier, uh, if you were close up, say, you, right there, and you hit him, that, it would cause a lot of damage, so that's why they used them. And uh, years ago, we uh, the last major uh, parade we participated in was Concord and Lexington. I think it was probably about six or seven years ago, maybe. 2000. Battle Road 2000. It was 2000, 17. <laughs> 17 years ago, okay. how time flies. But uh, one, of the one of the things that we experienced, Gordon was there, and Roy, and uh, John, and a, couple, a bunch of us, the rest of the company, and uh, we had to be there like at 5 o'clock in the morning, because that's when everything starts. They start off in Lexington Green, and then Battle Road continues from there, and you chase the British to Arlington. Okay, so. We didn't actually participate in the Lexington Green Park, but we were on Battle Road, right at the Concord Bridge, near the Concord Bridge. So uh, we formed up with the other uh, militia units from around different towns, Woburn, Linfield, you know, all the other ones. And uh, we were waiting in Miriam's Corner, they call it, and it's a park. And we could hear the British coming. And we were formed up in lines, because we would we were taught how to fire the muskets, and I mean, we knew, already knew how to fire the muskets, but we were told uh, we had a captain that was assigned to us, and the units were all mesh, mix, mixed in together. So we formed a big line, and we could hear the British coming, the br drums were drumming, and you could kind of get a sense of what it was like to be a militiaman in those days of waiting for this organized professional army to come up and you're going to face them. And uh, so they moved, they came down the road and they came along the park and they lined up right in front of us, say maybe about uh, 25, 30 yards away. And they started giving the commands. And they formed up and they said, fire. And they, they, of course they fired black powder over our heads and that was the command for us to fire at them as well. But you got kind of an eerie feeling that brought you back. They didn't sneak up. <laughs> it, gave, it gave you a sense of what it must have been like to be a Minuteman back in the 1700s. Basically, we drove sure. them back into the swamp. Yes, and then then we uh, retreated. Yeah. And, we, <laughs> and they drove us back. Yeah. And they marched on, but we chased them all the way down. <laughs> so that was a good experience. Yeah. Could I, um, I Like I say, I just have a couple of other things. Uh, I joined the unit in 1984 85. Uh, and the reason why I joined it was because I was new in town. Actually, I had moved in here in 81. And uh, so I was looking around for something to do. And I went to a Boy Scout presentation of the Minutemen. And uh, most of these fellows were there, except for John. And um, Nick O'Brien was giving a presentation. And most of you probably know Nick, Nick O'Brien. Uh, he was giving a demonstration of, of the attire. And what part of his presentation, we have very long shirts. The shirts were used to sleep in as well. So they're very long. They come down to your knees. So they were they had multi-purposes. You wore them plus you could sleep in them. So one of it, part of his presentation was he would drop his trousers. <laughs> and it's you couldn't see anything because the shirt was so long that people were shocked. When they first saw him drop his shirt trousers. So I said, I've got to join that unit. You want to do so, that tonight? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so I became the drummer in the group because some of the, like uh, this lady here was saying, her sons uh, were in the original group playing the drums. But we, at that time, we didn't have any more drummers left. <laughs> Had, they had moved on or whatever, so I said, well, I, I have some experience, so I became a drummer, and I've been a drummer ever since, so when you see the Memorial Day Parade, when you watch the parade, I'm the one that's out the front playing the drum. Thank you very much.